Aka Training Academy is an authorized training provider, accredited and endorsed by the ACFE International to provide training on the 4-day CFE review course, 10-day CFE preparation course, and all specialist workshops. The CFE course we offer consists of 10 days of training which is presented by our two consecutive weeks. The classes is presented by approved trainers that are very knowledgeable in their respective fields and have a combined experience of more than 50 years. In the class, the presenters will cover the work contained in the exam preparing for your exam. After the classes, you will have to do a bit of self-study before you are able to write your exam. Hi, I am Advocate the Boston Paramount, a Legal and Risk Manager at Bidvest Life Limited. The 10-day prep course by Africa Training Academy allowed me to work through a volume of material in a very short space of time. I was able to take all four parts of the CFE exam in just under a month. Being a CFE has well equipped me to combat fraud risk in my organization, and being part of the financial services industry, fraud risk is rife. Good day colleagues, my name is Peter Zwane, I work for the National Treasury in South Africa, I am a certified fraud examiner. Academy offers a wide range of short courses. These courses are designed to address different competence levels, a broad spectrum of industries, and any new developments within the fraud examination industry. Good morning, fellow fraud fighters. This is a momentous occasion for us. The first thing to share is that the ACFE South Africa chapter this year celebrates a quarter of a century of excellence. Yes, 25 years of excellence in fighting white collar crime and building professionals to fight white collar crime. So today is a day to celebrate not just a quarter of a century, but a further milestone, as you're going to hear during the course of this morning. At the outset, it's important that we appreciate the people, or the organizations, I should say, that have been a critical part of this journey. And they have been many as we have walked this journey. A special thanks to the following professional bodies for their support, assistance, and most of all, dedication to this project. In a short while, you'll understand why I say dedication because it has been a long journey. And they say when you're building a foundation, it's perhaps the hardest, most arduous task, especially when you're breaking new ground. So thank you to the ACCA, the AG of South Africa, AfroSci E, SEMA, ESAG, the IIA South Africa, the IRBA, PAFA, SICA, SAIGA, and SIPA. These are all organizations you are either a part of have heard of or engaged with in one way or another. Most of you are members of one, if not more, of these organizations. And the commitment of these organizations since the inception of this project has been sterling. Just to go back a bit as to where this all started, 
Back in 2013, a few thought leaders got around the table, or the proverbial table, SACA, the ACFE, the University of Pretoria, we gathered to discuss the potential for formal practice standards and to develop forensic accounting standards that support the professionals. SACA did publish something in 2013, and on the basis of that publication, everyone decided that those are the seeds we want to see develop into something that we call the forest that we've created and deliver the fruit that we are going to, to, to all imbibe. At the time, there were a few drivers. They say the organizations don't just exist um, as, 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 in the, uh, as uh, inanimate things, but they are driven by the people who have the energy to drive them. And at the University of Pretoria at that stage, we had Professor Dani Duplessis, the late Dani Duplessis, who was visionary in his thinking. Not only did he play a critical role in establishing the ACFE in South Africa, but he continued even after that to, to look at grounds that were green fields in our, in our sphere. Of course, he had so many men along with him. He wasn't the one dancing on his own because leaders always start the dance and then you need a follower. And Robert Cameron Ellis was the perfect follower. At that stage, Robert, I think you were the, the president of the organization, or a past president already at that stage. Shucks, I can't believe that. Um, I was also invited as a past president. Shucks, we're now old. And we, we joined in together with our effervescent CEO, who at that stage was, was relatively new in the space, but had many tasks to accomplish, amongst which was the development of these standards. So Jaco Diaga, and a few other people were, who, who were part of the journey and who wanted to see this come to fruition joined us to get our first official get-together at UP. But there was Saika who threw their weight in. And we are forever going to be indebted to the visionary Kelly Masete, who was a key role player who continued feeding our madness at that time. So today we stand here in this, in this forum, and for those of you who are streaming online, and we share with you a day that gives us great pride. Great pride because it's 10 years down the track and we are seeing this come to fruition. The signing of the standards. Yes, I did say it was a long journey, but in the scheme of things, 10 years is just one decade out of the 25 in terms of what we've accomplished, and we know that there's more. I'd like to welcome this morning the international organizations that are also part of the, the streaming this morning, and many of you who as our members have supported us by being a part of this journey. The international organizations helped us in this process because they allowed us to use some of their thinking to influence and uphold the standards inside their countries and in their organizations so that we have to some extent tested where, where we're going. Two specific organizations we'd like to, to appreciate today who are also on this, on this journey with us, who have signed up to support or endorsed these standards, are the Auditor General of Namibia, Junius Kanjeke, who is online, and the CEO of the Namibia Institute of Professional Accountants, Essie Haust. We say welcome to you both and thank you for being part of this momentous day with us. Finally, to the Africa Trading Academy, who continues to fund our process and fund the things that we're trying to do here, we say thank you very much. We know that the Africa Trading Academy continues to be a part of making sure that this profession is, the, is one of few where we always get together to share our trade secrets, because we know that the trade secrets do not exist. For us to move in the fight against fraud and white collar crime, we have realized that there's no such thing as a trade secret. And that what we think is a, could be a trade secret is actually going to advance us in just trying to be on par with the fraudsters. We're never ahead. However, who knows, with how we do things, we could qu be quite successful in making sure 
that we manage and limit the impact of fraudsters. So without further ado, let me hand over to Robert Cameron Ellis, who will take us through the standard practices for investigative and forensic accounting engagements as he shares with us the who, what, when, where, why, and how of these practices. Robert, a former president of the ACFE, and now, can I call you an elder? <laughs> but certainly a fountain of knowledge. Robert, over to you. Way back when we were young, <laughs> yes. Yeah, even before we had the ACFE, I'd gotten involved in forensic accounting. And in 1993, I was on secondment in London, the best bookshops in the world. And I start looking for books on forensic accounting. I want to make this a career. There were five or six chartered accountants in South Africa that were known for testifying. They didn't share their secrets, even the ones in your own firm, because that was their unique selling point. And I found one book published by PwC on forensic accounting. And as things developed, came back to South Africa, started with the, the South African chapter, driven by Dani, and there was this font of knowledge of how to investigate. The ACFE, their three lever arches of, 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 of documentation on what to do to do an investigation, how to prevent fraud. Not much on accounting and how the two interact. And yes, a certified fraud examiner needs to have a basic understanding of bookkeeping. And that's part of the curriculum. But it's not the chartered accountant, the ACCA member, the CIFA member who, who understands how to draft a, a, a set of financial statements, pull it together, move from trial balance through to, to um, published financial statements. It's not the person who knows how to analyze massive amounts of data. And the standards at that time, and at that time we, we really, we were limited. We were driven by three of the big four um, accounting firms, put a lot of effort into making the ACFE work. Along with the Institute for Internal Auditors, who were, took us under their arm and mentored us as an organization. And a number of their members, because internal auditors and, and accounting firms formed the basis of, of, of how the ACFE in South Africa started. Not many lawyers, not many investigators. That was the core group. But the ACFE has expanded. And, and as you well know, there are many lawyers that are certified fraud examiners. There are many computer scientists that are certified fraud examiners. There are many different disciplines, and yet we still don't have something that says this is how you should behave as a professional accountant. And the standard as it stands is a starting point. We can develop it as we now move into this, this area where there's specialization, where we say this is how we want to deal with things, we can look at, at, at how we can specialize. The accounting standards and auditing standards at the time published by, by um, SICA um, had one mention of the word forensic. And I think they've still only got one, I'm not sure. <laughs> but what we've got is a, is, 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 is a standard that actually deals with, 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 um, with how as an accountant, you can do investigative accounting, testify as an expert witness. It's a starting point to 
documentation of what needs to be done for this specific part of what is a complex interdisciplinary um, environment. So the big change from the initial meeting with Kelly, and there had been a earlier meetings in 2001, 2002, um, was the ACFE is a lot more inclusive now. It's a lot more, um, it, it reaches out a lot further. And you'll see the number of accounting bodies on that list that formed our Forensic Accounting Forum. It's not that core body that, 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 that created the ACFE in the first place and driven only by um, those professions. It recognizes that there are many different accounting disciplines and accounting professions in South Africa, in Southern Africa, and in Africa. And you've mentioned all of them. They all form part of, 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 of our working group, um, looking at, at the standards, looking at some of the controversial issues. And Mike and, and um, Prof. Small will talk about some of the, one or two of the more controversial issues um, in a moment. So, this purpose of the standards. Sorry. Oh. We, we also went through a process. We, we developed the standards and then there was a process of public input. And that public input went out to the members of those accounting bodies, the Institute of Internal Auditors, um, other interested parties, and we got a lot of feedback. I think we got, probably got more feedback then many of the, when, 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 when international auditing standards get developed, you know, that's worldwide and you've got all these, all these um, each country is giving input. We got a lot of feedback. Because some of the professional organizations got, you know, 100 people writing into them and they gave us the summary of, of those comments from their members. So there was a lot to actually edit and to change and to look at and to say, well, why did we write it like this? Can we write it differently? Can we be more clear? But in general, the feedback that we received from the individuals and the organizations that commented was very positive. So, practicing forensic accountants gave us feedback. Individual members of the, of the, of, of the, um, the forum. CFEs gave us feedback the big four accounting firms, universities, um, and IFAC. So what we've got today as part of the launch is two standards. The first is the standard practices. This is what you should be doing as a forensic accountant. And the second one, which I won't be talking about, is the qualifying criteria. But what is the base, what we expect of you to be as a forensic accountant. So let's have a look at the standard practices. The objective is to set a standard to have consistent practice across all forensic accounting type assignments. That the public know what they can expect, that we know what we need to do, and to protect the public. If you say that you are a forensic accountant, um, what is expected of you? Um, it creates a framework for ethical judgment. And there'll be two or three places where there, there are issues that are somewhat controversial. Um, can you do a, agreed upon procedures as part of a court proceeding? It's something that's, that's been debated. The Americans have, have, have finally come up with a standard. We've borrowed on their standard. We condense their 14 paragraphs into three, um, but it says essentially the same thing. And, and people have accepted that, they've looked at it, they've said, yes, we agree. In these cases, this is the way to go. Um, it prohibits offensive practices, and a lot of that ties back to both the accounting profession's ethics and the CFE's profession's ethics. And there's an overlap there, but sometimes there's differences. And this standard 
just lifts out some of those differences and says, this is the level or this is the, the standard that you are required when you are practicing as a CFE but also as a forensic accountant. These are the additional issues that you need to adopt. Um, and then to add value, you know, the nice thing about having a, a standard is you can create checklists. You can create your, your report in a format that has all 17 aspects that, it's, uh, that, that the standard requires. They're in your template already. Your letter of engagement has certain issues in it already. So it makes life simpler. It makes the admin simpler because this standard is not telling you how to do the forensic accounting. It's not telling you how to do the investigation. For that, you need an accounting background, an investigative background. Um, you need to understand your subject matter well. We're not teaching you in the standard how to do a forensic accounting uh, assignment. So, the standard is structured along seven lines. Who it applies to, engagement, acceptance, planning and scope of work, information gathering and analysis, file documentation, reporting, and expert testimony. Very simple, sweet. So, who it applies to. This is a document issued by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners South Africa chapter. It applies to certified fraud examiners that fall under our purview. And Yaku has, 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 uh, and, and the, the South African chapter has a mandate from international to expand the activities of the ACFE through Africa. So it would apply to those as well. But that's who it applies to. If you are an ACCA, a Chartered Accountant SA, and you're not a Certified Fraud Examiner, look to your own profession standards and apply them. You're welcome to adopt these, but it's not, uh, they don't insist that you adopt this. Right? It's only Certified Fraud Examiners to whom this, this standard applies. But it's certified fraud examiners who are also professional accountants. And the professor will take us through what we mean by a professional accountant, um, what the qualifying criteria are, and it's that overlap that we're dealing with, the bit in the middle. Fraud examiners are expected to have basic bookkeeping knowledge. That would be the green part on the left-hand side. You can do a fraud examination without calling yourself a forensic accountant. Professional accountants can do and go and testify on their work over and above being, you know, without being a certified fraud examiner. We accept this is not a, a regulated environment. It's an environment where our influence is on the certified fraud examiner that's doing the, the, the work. And that's that, that overlap in the middle. And then we say, what, what are the differences? You've got a set of accounting standards that you've got to comply with. You've got a certified fraud examiner set of, 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 of standards. And you'll see one of the things that we talk about where there are differences. is this idea of professional skepticism. Right? Many of the accounting professions have professional skepticism as a basis for how you need to approach your work. The certified fraud examiners go a level up. You actually need to have an investigative mind. It means we expect more of you in that intersection than what the accounting profession expects of you. Um, and we also expect that you bring your accounting profession's standards and practices into how you do the, the work. So, forensic accounting practices bring professional accounting skills together with investigative skills. 
and an investigative mindset to deal with disputes or allegations. Right? Disputes, you don't have to have fraud. Disputes are when you've got to actually go out and quantify a loss. But if you're quantifying a loss as a forensic accountant, so a professional that has an accounting degree, accounting registration, and a certified fraud examiner's ex uh, um, qualification, you need to actually bring an investigative mindset. We set the bar higher, and it's not that an a, a, a pr accounting profession wouldn't try to do that, but we expect it. Something more than just professional skepticism, it's looking at both sides, understanding that you may be misled in terms of your instructions, understanding that you need to have a thorough understanding of, of all the facts, and you disclose all the facts. So as I said, it's not basic bookkeeping, because that the certified fraud examiner has already as a, as a skill. It's when he's bringing these professional accounting skills to the party that we're looking at it. So many people who have a police background, a legal background, can quite easily do a fraud investigation with basic accounting skills, basic bookkeeping. When you need to bring the professional accounting skills into the party and you are presenting yourself as a forensic accountant registered um, as part of the ACFE, that's what we're talking about. Right, so, what are the next six aspects? The first one, sort of quite standard stuff that, that um, you, you'll find in many uh, accounting sets of standards. You'll find them in the ACFE standards as well. Documented scope of what you're going to be doing. Very specifically, setting out no contingencies on expert opinion. Full stop, we don't do it. Okay, if, if you want to try and twist your, your, your accounting profession standards to allow you to take a contingency, be my guest, but don't do it as a certified fraud examiner who's also an accounting um, professional. It's not allowed. It's spelt out in black and white. You must have the skills, or you must be able to develop the skills to do the assignment. Pretty obvious. Um, Interesting here is you, you need to disclose um, circumstances where your independence may be questioned. So it's not where you are not independent, but you need to be able to, to say, I might be questioned because of the following. The client needs to be aware of that, of potential conflicts of interest or ways that your testimony could be attacked. And then there's a section on, on what happens when you can't finalize an assignment? How do you hand back the documentation? How do you make sure the client isn't compromised in a, in, in a situation where you have to withdraw from the assignment? Right, planning and scope of work. As with any fraud in, um, investigation, you plan and replan. Now an audit you plan and then maybe halfway through you relook at your risks and you supposedly adjust your audit procedures to adjust for changed risks. In an investigation, it's quite often you don't have that same nice, clear path. It's a lot more messy to do or, or to create an expert report when you don't know what information is going to come through you don't know what the facts and circumstances are. Um, and the idea is that you plan, replan as circumstances change, you need to un be on the top of things. It's not one plan once, or one plan with one revision in the middle at a specific time. It's a plan and replan process. It allows you to bring in additional expertise, as long as you can understand and assess that additional expertise for reasonability. You need to take responsibility for additional expertise if you do bring it in, even if you don't understand precisely how they do it. You need to be able to understand what the basic concepts are and how that expert 
does their quantification. So if you're going to involve an actuary in your work, you need to be able to assess that actuary's work from an accountant's perspective um, and point out where you are unable to assess that. The standard very specifically sets out times when we need to get legal advice. Um, it also says you can, it, it's not you that's doing the work by yourself. It, it accepts that there are groups of people working together. The forensic accountant needs to, be, needs to supervise his assistance agent's subcontractors. He needs to take responsibility for their work. But it is allowed. It's not a thing that, that you know, quite often people say being an expert um, witness is very lonely. It is because in the end, you are the one in the box. But you can use other people to do some of the work as long as they are properly supervised. Right, information gathering. Big change from, from many of the accounting type, type standards. Um, you need to use an investigative mindset. It's more than just professional skepticism. You're looking for the motivations intents and biases in the documentation that you're receiving. It's a case of, of, of that, that discipline of understanding the fraud triangle, um, understanding how people would conceal things. We're looking for a higher standard of actually getting to the real answer um, in, 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 the, in these standards. You need to consider all the information. Now, this is one where lawyers don't like it. Right? They say, I'm going to give you this, and you write me an opinion. And you get a limited set of documents, and that's a problem. And when you're becoming aware of other issues, other documents, other facts, you've actually got to take them into account. It requires of you to take them into account. You can't just say, I was instructed to, to give an opinion on this. And these are the documents I was instructed on. And I closed my eyes to all the other information that was coming through. So it's, it's a different way of thinking. Um, and how, again, this, this protects you and it protects the public and it protects your client. But your client might very genuinely want you to make, give an opinion based on those documents they gave you. But the, in the end, we owe a duty to the court. And we've got to testify honestly and using that investigative mindset and understanding the biases potentially in the documentation. So it allows you to resist the situation. It's always good to be able to say to the, the lawyer that's giving you instructions, my my standards don't allow that. You can't only give me this documentation. I know that that and that and that, you've got it, and you don't want to give it to me. Um, therefore, I have a restriction in what I'm doing. Okay. Um, and then, back to the accounting terminology. Look at the substance over the form. Understand what the underlying transaction really is. Apply that discipline in how you, you're getting to it. And that's not something that necessarily is, is, is part of an ACFE's training. It's part of an accountant's training. Making sure you have proper chain of custody. And you need to understand how that chain of custody works. Um, preserving confidentiality. And having proper records of oral information that you've received. So that you can back up what you say in your reports. You're expected as a forensic accountant to make sure that what you're finding is reasonable. You're expected to step back two steps and say, does this make overall sense? Have I gotten too involved with the trees and I'm missing the forest? And that's, the, that, that's a skill that 
the accounting profession develops very well in, 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 in it, it's what an audit is, right? You're looking at a whole lot of different things. You're looking at bank and cash. You're looking at, at fixed assets. And in the end, the partner takes an audit file and overall looks at all of that, that detail and comes up with a three-paragraph opinion, right? As to whether that set of financial statements fairly present, is it reasonable? Right? And that, that's the, the auditor. It's not an accountant, right? There's a, a, your auditors and accountants are, are actually two different animals. You can't be an auditor without being an accountant. But that skill that, they, uh, that, that you learn in auditing of, of being able to step back and say, is this overall, does it make sense, is a very important part of the discipline of an accountant that needs to be incorporated into any type of forensic accounting investigation. Consider all the information against the findings. It's again this thing of, of what's missing. Have I been led down the garden path? Is somebody giving me um, just sufficient information that they get the answer that they want, as opposed to the answer that the court deserves? Consider alternative theories. Okay, and that's, that's one that yeah, the, the certified fraud examiner as part of any investigation, you've got to say, what possibly happened here? Who might have been involved? How do I, what, what is the various scenarios that I might need to prove or disprove to show that I've got the right picture? And you've got to incorporate that in, in how you do your work. Again, we've talked about earlier, can use the input of others, but with care. Right, the working papers are to contain or refer to all information used and relied on. And sometimes you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of documents. It doesn't say that they, they all need to be part of your working papers. There, there might be a repository of evidence, but the key documents that you are relying on need to be accessed and accessible as part of your working papers. You need to be able to document your opinion and how you built up that opinion. So it's a case of, of, of working papers. Um, often people say that the forensic accountant, his working papers are his report, but it's not always the case. Um, if you're doing things that are not necessarily in the report, you want to come back and say, well, these were the things that I eliminated. You've got to have working papers that actually support that, that elimination process. All relevant information needs to be given. And there, there you've got the, the certified fraud examiner's um, standards coming through strongly. It gives some guidance as to what happens if false or misleading information is being distributed. So if a, an old draft of your report is being um, distributed, what happens? If you've, if you've changed your mind, somebody's using an old draft of your report, how do you deal with that situation? There are a list of, of prescribed contents for your, um, for your report. It's not an onerous risk. list. You can actually comply with that quite easily. In your report, you need to disclose anything that might affect your independence. You can give ranges of results, different calculations. Um, and quite often in an accounting assignment, it is different ranges of results. And you give sufficient information for the tribunal to be able to make that final conclusion as to whether they go for the top of the range or the bottom of the range. Um, and you would obviously include your limitations in your, in your report. Right. Um, expert testimony. The purpose of expert testimony is to give impartial and objective assistance in understanding matters that are beyond the expertise of the tribunal. So if a judge doesn't understand IFRS, you've got to give him guidance as to how to interpret it and what are the basics that he needs to understand in order, or she needs to understand, 
in order to, um, to make a conclusion as to whether IFRS was followed or not. Um, if you're making decisions in your report and your testimony, there needs to be transparency as to how you made those decisions. If you made certain assumptions, you need to <coughs> list those assumptions. You've got to give clear guidance to the court as to how your thought process worked. And it spells out that you have that duty to the tribunal. Now, our, our, our law spells that out as well. Um, but this is your standard. It says this, if, if, if you're starting with a, an assignment, you have a duty to the tribunal, not a duty to your client. You've got to assist the tribunal in its decision. In expert testimony or testimony in court, no agreed upon procedures, except if both parties appoint you or the tribunal appoints you. Right? Agreed upon procedures are, are dangerous things because they are very easy to manipulate. Do the following, get to this answer. It's not a good way of, of eliciting that professional skepticism. So one can do that type of assignment, but only in very specific circumstances. Okay, to wrap it up, when is this, okay, this standard uh, applicable? Remember, it's, it's applicable to all certified fraud examiners who also have a forensic accounting, um, oh, sorry, and accounting, are also accounting professionals. All forensic accounting engagements commencing on or after the 1st of January 2024. But early adoption from tomorrow is encouraged. It's not difficult to adopt. Right? And if you're already a certified fraud examiner, you have that raised level of, skept of, of inquiring mind. If you're already an accountant, you probably already get, have a letter of appointment, you already are documenting and having working papers. It shouldn't be a difficult standard to apply. You just need to understand the differences between the accounting standards, the existing ACFE standards, and this merger of the two. Thank you. I'm sure you've, you've understood why I referred to him as the elder. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, a round of applause for Robert Cameron Ellis, who has chaired this Forensic Accounting Forum from its inception. And you can hear the, the passion when he speaks about the standard. Um, he is an independent forensic accountant who has worked in the trenches and continues to, to charter the way forward for the profession. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for the leadership. And I think if anything, forensic accountants going forward are going to see what you've seen and perhaps might not necessarily experience the difficulties you have because you've paved the way for most of us. So thank you very much. Colleagues, it gives me great pleasure to introduce another member of the forum, a person who's had great amounts of input from a <laughs> professional perspective. I'm glad I'm not the only one who's got that cough. He hails from a professional background, but also a, a strong academic, uh, representing SIPA, the executive of the Center of Future, Ex uh, of Future Excellence. He's going to address us on the qualifying criteria, what you need to know in that regard. So let's call to the podium, Professor Rashid Small. Good morning, everyone. I think as it has been stated, this is for me, as well as for all of us, a momentous occasion. For me, it started with a very simple saying or cliche. If doctors mess up, it affects a very small area of people, families, close friends. When accountancy professionals mess up, they affect the economy and the country. And that for me is 
what this launch is all about. So I'm going to speak to you about what makes a forensic accountant and why it is so important in terms of driving the economy. We all had doom and gloom when we heard that South Africa is now in, in grey listed. And everyone thought, what does grey listing mean? And the common saying was that, blame the accountancy profession. And now they're roping in the accountancy profession to bring us back into a more acceptable trading environment. So for me, when we started off this in terms of what type of person are we looking for to be a forensic accountant? What became important for me was to say, how do we transfer responsibility to accountability? I know we all like to be responsible. Because when I'm responsible, I seem to be the guy guiding. When I'm accountable, I want to be at the back. Now, forensic accounting for me said, we are prepared to lead and we are prepared to gain the trust of our primary responsibility of serving the public interest. Like Robert said, when you go into forensic accounting, you are sitting at a very precarious position. It's like walking a tightrope with spikes at the bottom. And the reason is you're fighting a completely mental process. Who do I serve? My paymaster, as Robert said, is going to tell me to look at ABC, but give me the answer that I want to hear. Do I serve the public? Do I serve my profession? So we need to know how to do that. It's the same thing that we're all fighting with now. Do I continue using my petrol car to go to electric vehicles? Or do I go with a hybrid? And for me, especially with our reliable electricity supply, a hybrid is the best. <laughs> so for me, when we, when we started with this journey, and I spoke a lot to Yako, I told him, Yako, if we can produce a person that's going to be not a specialist, he's going to be like a pipe cleaner. I don't know if you see those guys after they had the nice smoke, they relax, they take the pipe apart and they put these pipe cleaners in. Then they don't throw it away. They first look at what's on the pipe cleaner to determine what's going into my body. That for me is where the forensic accountant comes in. So when we're looking for a person to be a forensic accountant, we say that if you go back to the definition of a professional, which was designed in the 1800s, 1890, it says it's someone that the public will look up to for advice and guidance in difficult times. And I can tell you, when we started this project, and especially with the advances of technology, forensic accounting is the only one that will prevent countries and their economies from going into disaster areas. I think you all know what happened to the submerged vehicle when they wanted to go and see the Titanic. Because they did not do their work properly, they almost became the second Titanic. Disaster. Now for me, the professional uh, forensic accountant 
is that person who is thorough, know what they're doing, has the skills to stand up in court and be in that box and say, I'm here to convince you as to what the facts are. Like Robert said, all professional accountants have professional skepticism. Professional skepticism is an opinion and a mindset having our ears to the ground and backing it with our technical knowledge. But once you go into forensics, you must have an investigative mindset. Totally different. It's, we always say seeing is believing. An investigative mindset says, seeing is not as believing as it may be. Because what stands behind that facts is information that is hidden. So what we're doing with the forensic accountant is to say that you must understand the numbers, but you must understand what stands behind the numbers. You all know the saying, isn't it? Behind every successful man, there's a woman. But also behind the downfall of every man, there's another woman. <laughs> so when you're a forensic accountant, you need to make sure that you know which woman is standing behind the success of the person and the organization. So when we looked at how do you merge a professional accountant with all their skills and expertise with a forensic examiner on the other side, should you be two people or do you need one person that has the combined skills without being schizophrenic? You know, sometimes you go to your comfort zone to say, I just want to now look at the accounting part. The forensics, I know there's something wrong, but I don't want to tell. So being a forensic accountant, it tests your ethics beyond the standards itself. It tests your morals, your moral responsibility to the public. It tests your values to serve all parties that depend on your decision or outcome from your investigations. So when we looked at this, we said, let us look at what is common amongst the professional accountant and the forensic examiner. And let us first talk about the large level of commonality. Then we said, let us look at where the differences are and I think in the committee that we had, we had hot discussions, although it was cold here in the building at some times, but it brought us to say that we have more common areas than differences to dispute about. So how do we take those differences and work towards what Robert presented, that middle intersection? which means bringing the skills together to serve the greater good of society. When we looked at that, we said, we acknowledge that we, you need to have both sets of skills. Accountancy professions, professionals, as well as the skills required for forensic examiners. When we did that, we said, let us look at what makes a good accountancy profession. And then we said, the standards that drive the accountancy profession is your international educational standards. It gives you guidelines about what technical knowledge you need, what practical skills you need, what digital skills you need, what professional and ethical skills that's required. And then we said, yes, this is the one partner we want to have as professional 
accountancy professionals. Then we went also and say, are they regulated to ensure that they achieve the goal of serving the public interest? And we said, yes, we can tick that box as well. So we said, now we've got a basis of getting a person in this marriage to become an accountancy professional who has all the right DNA. We then said, the same as Robert explained previously, the forensic accountant, what's their DNA, what's their functions, what's their responsibility. Then the committee acted as the priest joining them in marriage to produce the new kids coming out, which are for forensic accountants. And that is what we then said. So we then said, yes, there's a qualification that you need, which brings you, equips you with all the technical knowledge. But we all know, oh, having the technical knowledge is not enough. You know these um, professional couch coaches, all the technical knowledge, they should have done that, they should have done that. This is what the technical guidelines provide. But if you cannot implement it, which is a responsibility of the accountancy professional organizations, then you need to say, the person may have to sit on the bench. He can't make the first 15 or the first 23. And that is where a lot of emphasis was said, let us look at the professional bodies governing the accountancy profession, look at how they regulate their members, making sure that the quality and integrity of the work that comes out will ensure faithful representation of the financial statements of the organization, its activities, and its results. Then we said, yes, so professional accountants is the one that is going to be part of this marriage. We then said, now, do they have the designation? Now, the designation said that the person is fit for purpose, that he is able to do the work that he is entrusted with. And like Robert said, accountants know the numbers, but they now need to delve deeper and say, do I know what drives the numbers? And that is where we then said, we need an accounting qualification and designation as part of the forensic accountant. Linked with all the requirements which were similar pathways for the forensic, forensic examiner, we then said, now we can mix them together to bring out a hybrid which will serve the purpose of ensuring that fraud and corruption will be mitigated. If not, facts will prove who's guilty, why they're guilty, how they committed the crime. All supported, as Robert said, factual evidence. <coughs> we can't have the forensic accountant coming and saying, you know, the, the corridor whinings, said, this person stole money. You know, when you go through the grapevine, you either, you either come throughout there smiling or that you just cannot walk straight. And the forensic accountant is going to say, I only base it on facts, like Robert said, if, that, if I hear something, get the information to support it. What became important also is to say that forensic accountants must be ethically untouched. They must have a, sta a standard of ethics that cannot be questioned. They must have a standard of ethics that will make the public accept what is presented as factual information as an opinion or as a report. So ethics 
is a critical part. We then look at, does the professional account, accountancy professionals have ethics? Yes, there's a standard on eth ethics. And we said, that is a must, together with their qualifications and designation. Forensic examiners, yes, ethics is also high on their agenda. And that is why you'll see, as Robert explained, part of the standard focuses a lot on ethics and ethical behavior. We then said quality is everything. Are there quality standards which governs accountancy professionals as well as forensic examiners? And we said yes. Robert outlined the process that you need to go through. I think all accountancy professionals know Big Brother is watching, and that Big Brother is ISQM 1, 2. And that's Big Brother. If you don't follow what Big Brother said, I don't know if you all watch the reality show, Big Brother, eventually you're going to be kicked out. So quality is very important. But quality focuses on the how to do, which means, have I done my planning properly? Do I have my engagement letter in place? Do I have my deliverables in place? Do I have my working papers? And I think in the profession, documenting verbal evidence is one of our biggest challenges. I don't know if there's a dyslexic between the ears and the hand, but we hear everything and we write very little. <laughs> but a forensic accountant must hear and write to support. And that is where your quality management comes in. But even what's more important for quality management do you have the evidence to prove that you have followed your quality management system? And quality management is very important because it focuses on the system of managing quality. And I know what most in all professions like is to do quality control. We look at the output. If the output looks good, it meets everything, then we assume all the processes before that met the quality standards. Now, quality management says the emphasis is on quality assurance. And quality assurance says all those steps which Robert went through, did you assess the risk? Do you have processes in place to minimize the risk? Can I say that that risk will not impact on the next process I'm going to do? And that is where quality management comes in. And forensic accounting is, and I can tell you, I did a couple of expert witnesses. When you're in that box, as Robert says, they strip you bare. They don't care about your feelings. They don't care about your designation. They strip you naked. And you must be able to say that I know most people dress up when they go to court. You must stand there and say that if you try to strip me naked, you'll just get another clean suit underneath it. <laughs> you won't see my skin. And that is what the forensic accountant does in terms of quality and quality management. Now, when we looked at the process, we said we, unfortunately, we can't create a hybrid person. But what we said was, you need to be regulated by your two separate professional bodies that you belong to. So you'll still be your professional accountant. You must meet the requirements 
for CPDs and all that. That will then also be done by the CFE, which you should be a member. So now you can say, I'm a dual member, but not a hybrid. So I'm regulated as if I'm a hybrid, but I have dual membership, dual responsibilities. But the relationship between all the bodies which you saw over there has agreed on that we are going to manage you collectively. So if you did something from an account accountancy professional's perspective, not grapevine, factual information will say, CFE, is this your member? This is what we have found about, out about this member. It won't be on your CNN, but it will be somewhere documented to say that you may have crossed the line. So that is the qualifications that's required. But also, the, the relationship between all the professional bodies governing the accountancy professional is going to work hand in glove. I don't know what it means, but I know they fit into one another. <laughs> I don't know if it's a hand into the glove or the glove over the hand, but it's hand in glove. And that is communication channels will be open to ensure that the regulation of the accountancy professional, as well as the forensic examiner through becoming a forensic accountant, will be managed in a seamless and flawless manner to ensure we achieve the goal of serving the public interest. Unfortunately, I had a nice presenta slide presentation with all fancy, you know, your powtoons, etc. And I said, no, that's going to be a distraction. So I wanted you to listen to me in terms of what I was saying because Sometimes you get messed up by the emotions of the presentations, and then you don't know what has been said. And for me, the designation and qualification to become a forensic accountant is of utmost importance to ensure that we will have a healthy economy, a healthy country, and that money will be used where it should be used to promote organizations, entities, and everyone. I know we all said, like was said earlier, we're trying to minimize white collar crime. We need to think about how do we now minimize virtual crime? Because it's no longer white collar crime. Everything is driven through the cyberspace. So I don't think white collar, neither blue collar works there. It's Darth Vader works there. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, you certainly kept us uh, keeping the attention in the right direction, Professor Small. <clears throat> Let's hear a round of applause once again. A committee member of the forum, he always brought the, the academic side and said, now let's just make sure that we've got this on the straight and narrow. Make sure that we are heading in the direction that is still practical. <clears throat> so we're going to look at the issue of professionalization. But before we do that, just a reminder for those of you who are virtual, that you can share questions on, on, on <clears throat> virtually. Submit your questions online. We'd like to take that into a question and answer session. There are quite a few that have come through. We've got congratulatory messages as well. But we'll, we'll share that later on for all those to celebrate. But I think there are some questions that definitely are coming up as the presentations are going on. And if you can share them online, we'll, we'll take them through for all of us to share. Um, so professionalization and international best practice, very critical aspect of why do we need to belong to more than one professional body? And what would the CPE requirements be in order for us to fulfill the requirements of each of those bodies? We don't have to search far and wide. 
the education and development uh, head of the ACCA of Southern Africa, here present with us today, Mike Gora will address that topic. Over to you, Mike. Let's hear a round of applause for Mike. Good morning, colleagues. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to check that you are still attentive. <laughs> uh, like the other speakers have said, it is indeed a pleasure and a great honor to be able to share uh, some of my thoughts on this uh, in support of what my colleagues have already said. Um, do you remember who said that accountancy is the language of business. Anyone? I think we all take it for granted, right? But if you try and Google and search, I think somewhere along the, the line, they try and attribute it to Warren Buffett. I don't completely agree, but I think you agree with me that it is true. And for me, it is true globally. And this partly explains why you find that the accountancy profession is the one of those that's globally benchmarked because we all need to be speaking or working from the same page. So as a result of this, you will notice that there has been significant development of architecture around how do we achieve that kind of a very high focus, and this requires cooperation and close working with all professional bodies. And a very good example of this is the International Federation of Accountants, IFAC. And I think Prof and Robert have actually alluded to this. And this for me, I think, is a very important starting point because what that does is we have a collective responsibility to make sure that we live up to the expectation. And what does IFAC say? IFAC says it is the voice of the accounting profession globally. So how do they ensure that all the stakeholders in the ecosystem actually deliver on this. There's something that most of you are fully aware of. They call it statements of membership obligations. And this requires that all the members actively support this. And it's underpinned by what Prof and Robert have adequately covered. It's acting in the public interest, collectively and individually we have to ensure that we are, in fact, working in the public interest. And how do you support that? You su evidence it by having standards. Prof Small spoke about the international education standards. He spoke about ethics. We know about accounting and auditing standards. We know about assurance standards. All these are evidence that there is a support structure, that the profession is collectively and individually working in the public interest. But we are also conscious of the freedom of association and right of choice, right? Uh, that gives the professional bodies an opportunity to develop niche specialisms each of the professional bodies, although they are singing from the same hymn or reading from the same Bible, depending on what you prefer, you find that there is a high level of commonality. There is a base that everybody is working to. So why do we need to have dual membership? Dual membership is necessary because as Prof Small is adequately uh, covered. You have the qualities and the professionalism that comes from being a member of a professional accountancy organization. 
which is key and underpinning knowledge. But likewise, you need the expertise and competency of a fraud examiner. So we then said, okay, we've looked globally. Let's bring it closer to home. We have an architecture and a framework that already regulates PAOs, and that is SAPA. So we said, wait, why reinvent the wheel? Let's work with what we have. We will say, if you are a member of any of these PAOs, and we saw them listed, you also need membership of ACFE, because ACFE is also on the same national framework. So that should be the answer to why you need to be both. You need to be a member of both. I would like to give the example of uh, medicine, right? You do your five years at uni, then you do your uh, 18 months or two years, depending on where you are, uh, housemanship. On the back of that, you then become a general practitioner, right? But if you want to specialize, if you want to be a surgeon or any of the other specializations, there is additional requirements. You are required to then undertake additional theory and practice so that, you know, we as members of the public, if you're having issues with your eyes, I don't want to go to an opt optician who is essentially a GP. So as the profession, we have taken exactly the same view. And I think for me, uh, what I really, really liked about this is, yes, it's been a long journey, plus or minus eight years, but it's a classic example of how the profession acting collectively can actually work in the public interest. We've been able to, yes, we had our ups and downs, but we persevered. We persisted because we were so, so clear in our minds that this is a good example of working in the public interest. Yes, it's more onerous because what we are basically doing is we're raising the bar. We're not waiting for the regulators to come to us and say, wait, if you're going to be experts and you want to be trusted in this space, these are the standards, it's the other way around. Is the profession collectively saying, this is the bar and this is how we want to make sure that everyone in this space will actually be as proficient as necessary. So that's the good news. Uh, we must be all aware and conscious of the fact that nothing is constant. Change is the only constant, right? So while as we launch these standards today, you meet all those standards that you're aware of. Be aware that there is a huge ob a burden, obligation on your part. You need to maintain that competence. You need to maintain that level of expertise, which brings me to the last point, continuing professional development, or CPD for short there is a real, real need to keep ahead of the curve. So please, let's maintain our competence so that we can demonstrate that we have earned the trust that comes with this uh, new designation. <coughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, that was Mike Gura. Mike, thank you very much for putting it very succinctly in terms of the need to belong to more than one professional body and the CPE requirements because quite often when one talks of CPD, one perceives it to be from a, from a vested interest perspective, particularly when it comes to professional bodies. And the reality is that we know what we did 10 years ago and what we're doing today has vastly changed. Uh, the one thing that I, I take away, and I think everyone needs to take away, is the one constant is change. And if we forget that, we're likely to be like this pond of water that stands there, and over time it evaporates. <coughs>
But if it doesn't evaporate, it starts giving off a stench. So the question is, do we want to be that stagnant pond of water, or do we want to be as fresh and as invigorating as that which continuously flows? The choice is ours. So we've got an early foray into the question and answer sessions, and we'd like the questions to come through. We have a few questions for our panel <coughs> here today. And uh, we'll start off with, with one of the earlier questions that we, we got. Um, and it dealt with, with the question around accounting bodies, if I can just go. Uh, so all positive comments here, great initiative. And it says, do you see this as creating a new field, more formalized for specialization for accountants and auditors? That is, we are accountants and auditors, I am a CA or I am a ACCA, is this an area of specialism that is now starting? Or is it just another profession? <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Don't okay. Um, I think it's a very relevant question. Um, and I'll give my view and uh, from an ACCA perspective. Uh, when ACCA was invited to join the Forensic Accounting Forum, we looked around uh, because we've got a global footprint. We said, look, what's happening in other territories? And we actually found no prior example. Then we said to ourselves, look, let's think about what it is that we are trying to do. And we came to the conclusion that it is the right thing to do because while we pride ourselves in the competencies that we build into our members, we took the view that forensic was in fact an example of an area of specialization. And in keeping with our own guidance to our members, we felt that this added an additional layer. To go back to accounting, which we are all very familiar with, uh, Robert shared a very good example earlier. In order to be an auditor, not just in South Africa, but globally, you must first qualify as a professional accountant with your PAO, right? But on the back of that, whether through your PAO under delegated authority or under a separate regulator, as is the case in South Africa, which is EBA, you are then required to gain and demonstrate additional competencies. So we saw forensic accounting as a, an extension and an opportunity for members to then demonstrate additional competencies. And in closing, I think that it also works both ways. Mm. If you are already an ACFE member, this is an opportunity for you to say, wait a minute, I'm going to become a professional accountant as well. Because what that does is, is you are raising the bar. You are demonstrating that this is a specialism and not everybody can be a specialist. To go back to my example, not every doctor is a surgeon. Yeah. So I think that, that touches on one of the other questions here, which is, do I have to belong to both professional bodies in order to be a, a forensic accountant? Um, and I think maybe if you want to elaborate on that. Yes. I think it's very important in terms of finding a home that suits your specialism. And to be a member of a single body means that you are very focused in that particular area. But because you're now being this hybrid of an accountant together with a forensic examiner, you need to be a member of both bodies in terms of ensuring that you meet the standards which governs both membership. And I think in terms <coughs> of it's the question then comes is, why must I have a dual membership? And I think the dual membership is to say that to remain relevant, each professional body focuses on their area of expertise. And the professional bodies has acknowledged that if you want to create too many specialisms, you'll become so thin that there's no need for transparency. And I think also the regulation of both forensic accountants in terms of the two bodies have their own 
unique CPDs as Mike has mentioned, and therefore to ensure that you can operate on both levels, you need to ensure that you are associated with people who are like-minded and governed in that same manner. So yes, it is important to be a member of both professional bodies. So Robert, a question that comes through is that you spoke of contingencies. Can you explain that or debunk it for, for, the, for the audience? Yeah, essentially, no, um, no fee arrangements that if you win, you get a certain amount. Um, you are paid for your time, paid for your professional uh, uh, opinion, um, but not for, for what you say. And no, no contingencies, no if we win we get a certain amount because then you are biased. So that's a reference no to the remuneration, yes. right? Because the idea is to continue being independent and, and the, the challenge with independence is if you have a contingency based on outcome, um, you're it's questionable whether you, you're independent. Can I just add to that? And I think if you look at the international ethics standards now, they have seen that financial reward is one of the greatest areas where independence is. And I think contingencies fit into that because if you want to the most as financial reward, you need to satisfy someone. And you can't satisfy everyone. And that is where your personal bias and professional bias should never be placed in question. It starts becoming a question of who's your master, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Rashid, the question specifically to you. Will the accounting professional bodies also be driving these standards going forward? And how will these bodies then uh, work to, to assist the members? I start with the latter one first. I will assist with the members to become members of the ACF, become forensic examiners. We are looking at strategies in terms of articulation, but also in terms of looking at how we can make it affordable to become the professional me um, members of the ACFE. So in terms of that, Forensic accounting has been recognized as a scarce skill, not only in the profession, but also in the country at large. So that is what we're looking at. And in terms of ensuring that we'll, thank you. Ensuring that we can also maintain the quality and standards, there will be this constant dual communication, both from the accountancy professional bodies and from the ACFE to ensure that this type of information is disseminated to all who are interested in being forensic, forensic accountants. Mike, perhaps you can weigh in on, on uh, will the bodies be driving these standards going forward? Yes, absolutely. Um, we've already started. Uh, we had our members annual general meeting on Thursday last week. And this was one of the agenda items. And I must uh, share with the colleagues in this room that it was really well received because we have members who think of, they think they know, but when we had the discussion, they then started saying, oh, that's what it means. We said, yes, we have to raise the bar. But they welcomed it because they saw it as an opportunity to get another additional area of specialization especially for members in practice, because they then say, wait a minute, if I can do this, it means that another revenue stream. But the way we are also driving it is through our partners. Uh, we've got a, an African footprint, as you know, and one of the reasons that we discussed in the Forensic Accounting Forum was that this is such a unique and innovative way of doing things that we mustn't limit it to South Africa, because as a cluster, we look after Southern Africa. And already you can see the example that was shared earlier, I think it's you, who said the Auditor General of Namibia is on the call. He is uh, one of our key approved employers. We work very closely with him. But we're sharing this, for example, with uh, Botswana, 
Botswana is in the process now of coming up with corporate governance code. So one of the things I mentioned, because we do a lot of work in that market, I said, are you aware? This is something that you may want to think about because the whole point about governance codes is the architecture to create the best uh, governance and of course target white crime as we try and do. We've done the same with Zimbabwe. We've said, guys, this is something that you may want to look at. And the regulator there said, yes, very good idea, because we don't believe that you can have individual chapters in each country. I think it's much easier to align to the regional body, and then we spread it that way. So we, we are doing it on multiple fronts. Thank you. Robert, maybe you can take this one, a very simple question, but uh, perhaps an even more simple answer. Must I be a member of the ACFE to be a forensic accountant? Okay. No, because this is not a designated um, legislated position. Members of the ACFE who want to call themselves forensic accountants must comply with the standard. Somebody who's outside of those circles we have no jurisdiction over, um, and they can call themselves what they want. It's an unfortunate part of, 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 of how the professions are, are structured in South Africa. Um, so the, the, it, it, it doesn't create an exclusivity, but if you're a certified fraud examiner and you call yourself a forensic accountant, then you must comply with the requirements, the minimum requirements for belonging to a professional accounting body, and to the standard. So it's the other way around. Mm. If I'm a CFE wanting to call myself a forensic accountant, I need to belong to one of the professional bodies mm. that is, is accounting aligned. So that makes it easier. It's not a question of if I'm part of one of those bodies, for me to use the designation forensic accountant, I've got to be a member of the ACFE. Okay. I hope that's gone a bit clearly, but if someone is still, still hazy, you're welcome to raise it again. So what are the qualifications required for a forensic accountant? I think we, we dealt with that in the presentation, but maybe just to pull it all together in a couple of sentences, Professor Small. I think the first part is that you need to be a member of a um, accountancy professional body which means you follow the streams, and I think part of the information that will be published is how do you enter those streams. Mm -hmm. And the second part is that you need to become the forensic examiner, which is also published in terms of that. So the streams are there. And unfortunately, like I said, there's no hybrid qualification at this point in time. You need to be an expert as a professional accountant and also a professional as a forensic accountant, and the two together will allow you to perform both tasks. And then maybe a follow-up question that's come through is for me to transition from a professional accountant to a forensic accountant, do I need to upkeep my SIPA membership as well, for example, and interestingly they mentioned SIPA, <laughs> even if I plan to only practice in forensics, do I still have to be a member of SIPA? If I want to practice as forensics? Uh, unfortunately, yes, you have to. And I think Robert explained it quite well that you need to have a strong accounting or bookkeeping background to perform the forensic accountant work functions. And I think what becomes important is that it's all about the reliance that the public will place on you. It's like we always have in the medical profession, once again, if I'm one of these faith healers, am I a professional? If I did not have the normal medical profession qualification behind my name, and I think that's the type of thing, it's what do the public trust? And I think, like Mike says, we are all involved in driving businesses to drive the economy, so you need to understand accounting, and I can tell you with technology and the type of transactions which are concluded, the complexity of them, you need to still retain your dual membership. I suppose the fundamental to maintain is that it's a multidisciplinary profession. Robert? Yeah, it's fortunate that our professions insist that we keep ourselves up to date. 
If Psyche didn't insist that I have my CPD and I understand the new developments in accounting, if Irma didn't uh, insist that I have followed the new developments in auditing, um, that I do certain amount of, 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 of subject-specific CPD, over and above what I do for, for my ACFE qualification, because that relates primarily to fraud. Right? I would not be up to date and I would not be able to go in and, 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 and testify as an expert in that area, as somebody who understands how it all fits together. And we need to keep, to keep that discipline up. Um, and there's no ways that the certified fraud examiners can start providing that type of technical skill that the ACCA or SICA provides to their members. We've got to belong to those accounting bodies. We've got to have the CPD. We've also got to have the contact with members of our profession um, to be able to talk to and understand developments in the profession. Um, so no, you, you, if, if you're going to go stagnant as an accountant if you drop that qualification and become a certified fraud examiner. I suppose if, uh, if we bring it home a little more visibly, uh, can you imagine a doctor attending to you who hasn't heard about COVID? <laughs> it starts hitting home when you think along those lines. Are there any questions from you who are seated here uh, before I continue with the online questions? Thank you, Prof. I want to ask a question about <clears throat> being a forensic accountant. So what, what are the various bodies involved doing to make sure that the market understands it, that the market is driving that membership of both organizations, right, or both associations? So, yes, it's not a designation, but how do we get the market to select someone as a forensic accountant, the way it was described today, versus anybody else holding themselves out as a forensic accountant. And I think all of us in the room have a responsibility to do that. Thanks. I'll start, uh, Alta. I think if you look at the enforcement of the FICA regulations that's been placed on the accountancy professional bodies as being one of the enforcers for that particular regulation. If you look at the reports from the FATF, which gave us a gray listing, they're putting the accountancy profession at the forefront of it as well. And I think if you look at what's happening in terms of legislation that's going to come and govern the profession in terms of anti-money laundering, I think it's also going to force the profession to say that we need to make sure that the market out there know that there need to be regulations of people who's performing functions as a forensic accountant. And I think in terms of the FAT regulations, you'll see that uh, the accountancy profession as a whole are saying that includes a forensic, forensic accountant that they need to be regulated and recognized to fulfill those responsibilities. So yes, it's going to be a marketing exercise, and I think we've discussed it uh, in our committee in terms of how we're going to ensure that people who perform forensic work can be trusted and to serve the public interest, that they need to be recognized and managed and regulated through professional bodies. I'm not sure if anyone wishes to add, but I think it's really a question that goes back to the, the, the professional bodies that are part of this, of this process, um, having to, to come to the party. Huh? And, and, and really, it's the, it's the action that comes hereafter, right? So, so we launch this forensic accountant uh, uh, sort of profession, professional, and uh, it's a question of how, and there are lots of questions coming here. Is there, is there an exam that an individual needs to take in order to be a member of the ACFE, for example? And 
And these are questions that are FAQs on the websites of both the professional body that you're part of, as well as the ACFE. Uh, Robert, any, any guidance for the various questions that are coming here that say, how do I become this forensic accountant? Just some guidance. I, I think it, it's taking us right back to the basics, but maybe just to share with the audience. Okay. The CFE qualification is, is very much a secondary qualification for many people. They come from a primary discipline of accounting, law, computer science, or investigation. Um, and then add the CFE on. And in that case, it, if, if you've got a chartered accountant who be, wants to become a CFE, he needs to do two years, get two years experience and write the ACFE exam. You can also, and Jaco correct me if, if I'm wrong, you can also as a matriculant become a CFE with 10 years experience, no underlying graduate degree. Um, and write the exam. So there are two ways of becoming a CFE. Um, but to become a professional accountant, there are many different ways. There's the way that I went through it, articles, similar ACCA has, has, has a similar process, SIPA have, have a similar process, um, with an underlying academic qualification. And generally those people would add the CFE on. Um, it's not a case of, of first becoming a CFE and then becoming a professional accountant. It's generally you're a professional accountant first with this additional set of skills that allows you to apply that accounting knowledge in the fraud examination area. Thanks, Robert. I, I see a few more questions. So there's one here that says, uh, so the auditor and forensic accountant can work together, but who produces the report and what kind of report is it? <laughs> I'm throwing it to all three of you. <laughs> this, this is a curveball. I think uh, Robert explained it so well earlier on when he said that ultimately the accountant, uh, forensic accountant will be responsible for everyone who does work in respect of that because that forensic accountant will be the person that can rely on expertise from an auditor or any other specialist. And the end of the day, it's who signs of the report, and that is the forensic accountant. And I think Robert gave a clear example in terms of if you want to rely on experts to assist you, you're still accountable for that particular responsibility. Mike, just uh, a follow-on from that. Um, so you have a broader Southern Africa view on this. The likelihood of acceptability within the other territories outside South Africa, um, is, there, is there this open door and, and perhaps people waiting to, to embrace the forensic accountant in terms of how it is? Yeah, what informs that? that? Yeah, th thanks. It's a very relevant question. Um, if you look at SADAC, uh, most of the countries within the SADAC region have embraced uh, what we call comprehensive regulation. If you look at South Africa and the ROSC report, I think it was 2018, it, touch, it touched on this as well. But South Africa is not yet there because there was an attempt, but I don't think that there is much progress or political will. So let's start with, uh, say, Zimbabwe, right? Zimbabwe has got the Public Accountants and Auditors Board, and their approach is comprehensive regulation. Everybody who is in the accounting profession is regulated by them. This means that they regulate the accounting technicians, and they regulate uh, professional accountants, and they regulate the auditors in that market. And the rationale for this is that they look up to the accounting profession is, uh, like I said in my opening remarks, uh, the work that the accounting profession does is a direct impact 
on economic activity. Uh, ACCA produced a report recently called The State of the Accounting Profession in Africa in partnership with my colleague uh, Alta from PAFA in PwC. And it really goes to town about the link between the quality and level of sophistication of the accounting profession in any country and the economic development thereof. So this partly explains why comprehensive regulation is the preferred model. So these regulators are looking for innovation from the profession, like what we've done here today, to say, look, we see gaps in the skills that are in this area, and we propose to close them. And it goes without saying that corruption is a big impediment in terms of economic development, not just in South Africa, uh, by the way, or Africa for that matter. Mm. The corruption is endemic globally. The difference is the scale. You know, I'm sure you've heard the joke about somebody says, you know, uh, I took 10% here, and the other guy says I took 100%. Mm. So I think that regulators generally look to the profession as an economic enabler. So yes, there's a very strong appetite. So Botswana has got comprehensive uh, regulation. Uh, Zambia has got comprehensive regulation. Uh, uh, Namibia is in the process. They've just done it. Uh, the, they're waiting for the parliament to approve comprehensive regulation. Uh, Eswatini is looking at comprehensive regulation. So yes, within my class, the comprehensive regulation is more the norm, with the exception of South Africa. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do remember that the ACFE is a global organization yeah. with members all over the world, and they're all busy. <laughs> <laughs> we do have some colleagues here who, um, from Saga, Russell in particular. So, Russell, let's hear from you. Oh, sorry. Oh, I was instructed that I need to stand up. Thank you. Um, uh, Russell Morena from Saiga. Uh, here's a question to the panel. Um, let's say I am a registered government auditor, RGA, already. And in addition, I'm an SFE. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm a, a CFE. Do I automatically qualify as a forensic accountant? So this question is to the panel. Thank you. So, Robert, I think that's something you, you've touched on. You I don't know. I'll have to get the notes there. <laughs> <laughs> Can I pass them to you? I think what happened is, if you, as you explained, Russell, the fact that you are already a RGA, which means you a member of an accountancy profession, and the fact that you're also a CFE means you meet that requirement. And remember, we spoke about the hybrid. So therefore, in that case, you are eligible to become a forensic accountant, but once again, you need to demonstrate that you have practice both in the last couple of years. If you did it 10 years ago as a forensic accountant and now you are a registered auditor, then you may be outdated and then you need to be upskilled. Okay, there, there are six different designations that we've already recognized as complying with the criteria. In other words, the professional body subscribes to the right code of ethics. The level of training and, and educational requirements are sufficient. If you get that qualification, it's, it, it's acceptable as, as a professional accountant. Um, so it's the ACCA qualification, the CASA qualification, then two SEMA qualifications, the ACMA, G CGMA, and the FCMA, CGMA. Um, then the uh, Professional Accountant SA, and the RGA SA. So those are the six qualifications that already have complied with the, 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 the minimum requirements. There may be more coming, but those are the ones that are on the list at the moment. 
And because they are applicable to CFEs, these will be listed on the CFE website if anyone wants to, to establish. Yeah, and it's at the back of the standard, it's the last, last paragraph of the qualifying criteria. Whilst we, whilst we walk across to that question there, I think we want to just kill off a question here, which I think is fairly straightforward to answer, and it says, are lawyers excluded then since they don't belong to an accounting professional body? Um, yes. <laughs> Mike, 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 I think you want to answer that question, <laughs> depending on their trust account status. Yeah, no, I, I think Robert has given us a very comprehensive answer. Uh, I would say they are not excluded uh, forever, I would say they still need to meet the standard. Uh, if Let's say you are a lawyer, you are a CFE, you then need to meet the professional accountancy membership. And I would take the clue from Robert. And if you become a member of that professional accounting body, yes. you're then, you're then, then you meet the, the requirement. Yeah. So I would uh, classify it more positively, position it as work in progress. You're not excluded. No, not excluded, you but not yet there. These bodies. Yeah. yeah. Shall we take this? Um, good, good day to the panelists, those online and those in the room. I'm Advocate Andrea Johnson. I'm the investigating director. I have the enviable task of dealing with state capture matters. I have two comments, not questions. Um, I have to thank the ACFE because when I took office on the 1st of March last year, what was glaringly apparent is that the investigators, that is the financial investigators assigned to the investigating directorate, needed the accreditation for the CFE. So we did send through, I think there were 19 of them. They went through the course, wrote the exam, passed. And much to my dismay, in the past two months, I've lost five of them. <laughs> two to SOEs and one to their special investigating unit. So. The long story short is, it is really a remarkable something to be a CFE. What it has done is, in my investigative space, where we have financial and criminal investigators, it brings a different flavor to how we deal with our matters, how we prioritize matters, how we deal with financial flows, how we deal with money laundering, racketeering. We have a different perspective on mutual legal assistance, what to ask the different FIUs, etc. So. Thank you very much. I think the second thing for me that's most important is the standards have got to become the Bible of the profession. Um, we had a matter in court not so long ago, and the flip-flopping of a financial investigator did cause us to lose our case in the main. Because I think what is important is, why did you make the finding? What did you rely on? Stand on it. Your skepticism does no one any good. Uh, and it is that skepticism of that is where the defense will get us every, every other time because what you do is they give you a scenario and as opposed to saying, I've dealt with what I've dealt with based on what I base it. Your scenario is hypothetical. So I can give you a hypothetical response, but it doesn't take this matter further. And maybe going forward, those are some of the issues we should deal with in terms of expert testimony how to deal with these issues in court, still maintaining your independence and your credibility in your profession, but making sure that the court gets the evidence it's supposed to get. So thank you very much. Thank you. There, there was a question, and maybe, maybe it was directed at you who've already answered it. It says, should the NPA and other entities not start insisting that professionals meet these standards to ensure people working for them or testifying do have the skills to testify and do the work. How can we see this enforced to secure uh, and, and professionalize? So I think you've given the guidance, you've given the support, and maybe at this juncture, there are many questions that deal with how do we become members, how do we um, become members of both, uh, how do I ensure that I've got this qualification, I'm a CFE and become part of a professional body. There are many questions that need to be answered. However, the ACFE, Yako, if I understand what you and the team are, are putting together, will have some FAQs on the website. There will also be a contact point to share the guidance on who, what, where, how to become these. But perhaps the final question for the panel is, um, 
how do other bodies come on board? Will there be other bodies coming on board? And what will the basic criteria be? So maybe if I can hear a bit from each of you, we'll start on this end, Prof. Small, and then we'll end up with, with the chairman. I think um, what we try to do is to say we want to be inclusive to serve the public interest. And I think like Robert mentioned earlier, the committee that started this is, we started the fire for the braai, but everyone's invited. So once again, the invitations will have to meet the criteria and the standards which we have stated. And if they do not, will be more uh, less punitive, but more supportive to ensure that they can also join, even though it may be at a later stage. So that is what we are doing, and I think we are working on a strategy to say, how do we incorporate a larger proportion of professional bodies to ensure that they can also become forensic accountants? Like some yeah. Comments on that? Uh, I fully agree with Prof. Uh, but I think for me, the big piece, and I'm grateful to Alta for asking the question, is how do we get the ecosystem to widen? And I think that's something that is a forum. We looked at, but I think we need to do much more work because it's about acting in the public interest in a proactive manner. So yes, we can include other professional bodies, but I would love to see a situation, as my colleague has just touched on, how do we get the SOEs that are active in this space? How do we get the regulators that are active in this space to appreciate how do we, for example, work with SAWA? Mm. How do we say, look, this is an important development. Can you come to the party? Because if the ecosystem is also inclusive and comprehensive, the uptake will go. For example, we're talking about uh, gray listing. So where is the banking services in this? How do we make sure that they are part of it? And in my view, the bigger the ecosystem, the better the co-creation, the better will be the impact. Thank you. Robert. Hmm. Okay, I think we, we must just remember that We've got minimum criteria now. So to involve another accounting body, say from Zimbabwe or Mozambique, they, most accounting bodies subscribe to international ethics. Um, they are part of the IFAC family, perhaps not members of IFAC, but there's not much that excludes accounting bodies throughout Africa to join. Um, so the minimum criteria are there for accountants or accounting professions to join up and say, we've got a, a, a qualification, this is our criteria and this is why we, 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 we can comply and we can add to those six items on the list um, quite easily. What we must also recall is, is that this is not meant as, as for all professions, right? The Institute of Internal Auditors was one of um, the participants in the forum. But their members, unless they have an accounting qualification, as well as being Institute for Internal Auditors, are not part of this particular level of specialization, the same as lawyers, right? Or somebody who's doing ordinary investigation that requires a basic level of, of knowledge of bookkeeping. There's also, all of those, people benefit from the ACFE qualification um, and can actually do um, fraud examination. It's when we start specializing and we're bringing in accounting concepts that we have this particular designation um, becomes applicable. Um, so it's wide open for other accounting bodies, but there are lots of other professions um, with, which will not qualify, but we will also benefit from being an ACFE. And it's about being able to talk the technical language when you're put in that stand, which is what we heard earlier, to be able to carry that through. So it does not mean that people who are involved in the process are excluded. It just means who's going to be in that stand with that designation to be able to do justice to it. 
So colleagues, I'm going to thank our panel. It really is an esteemed group that, are, that we have here in front of us. Robert, Mike, Mike Gora, and Professor Rashid Small. To say thank you to you, thank you for the, for the months and months and months of input. Uh, thank goodness we had a break in between called COVID to give you some time to reflect so that we could give it the final push. But I think I say it in jest, however, it was, it was, it was a fact that there were some really heated moments when parties who sat around the table actually couldn't see how this would work because everyone wanted to hold it on. And eventually sanity prevailed because we understood that the purpose is really to have standard practices that protect by ensuring a consistency with a minimum standard of practice to be met. You can shoot the lights out by having a higher bar within your particular profession, but we're saying there's a base that everyone should have. And that base, we can continue enhancing, we, can, can, we will have to continue refining, and that will happen to, through continuous professional development. So the forensic, the standard practices, they were developed to improve the consistency and comparability of practice amongst the CFEs, because we all come differently enabled. But CFEs performing investigative and forensic accounting engagements in their capacity as forensic accountants, so that when you are a CFE who purports to be a forensic accountant, there's an expected minimum skill that you bring to the table and capability. There are several international cases that make it very clear that this is a necessity. There are cases that say we need to walk the road by having a standard that ticks the blocks from an international perspective as well. Not just to protect the profession, but ultimately the general public who rely on us as forensic accountants. So thank you for all the, the inputs of all those here in this room and those on the call who made their comments, who contributed to the establishment of the forensic accountant. We are now on the road, as Professor Small has said, the braai is now lit. Let's bring to the party what we need to. Thank you very much, we appreciate. <laughs> to give effect to this, we're going to ask the representatives of the various organizations who are signatories to this, uh, to this launch of this designation, the ACCA, the Auditor General of South Africa, AfroSci E, SEMA, ESAG, the IIA South Africa, PAFA, SICA, SIGA, and SIPA. At the back of this room, there is a table at which you will, you will have to append your signatures so that we give effect to this designation. I would be failing in my duty if I did not thank the chairman of this forum, Robert, um, he has driven this from day one, and he has driven it with the kind of integrity that we are all proud of. Robert, thank you for the leadership. We know that we are in a better space and heading in a direction that many years from now we will look back and say, wow. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Whilst I'm saying thank yous to the, the team at the ACFE, Roxanne, you and the team that have put this together, we are extremely grateful for the manner in which you do things uh, professionally. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the morning. We shall proceed with the signing.